Hey everybody, it's your boy Sam here with a note about today's episode. The first thing that you're going to notice is that there's no video of Sari. We had a little bit of trouble with her footage, but in its place we've provided a beautiful, theme-appropriate laser show. And of course, you can still look at me and Hank's ugly mugs. So without further ado, please enjoy today's episode about lasers. See you after the intro! And welcome to SciShow Tangents. It's the lightly competitive science knowledge showcase. I'm your host, Hank Green, and joining this week, as always, is our science expert, Sari Riley. Hello. And our resident everyman, Sam Shaw. <laughs> Hi, what's up? <laughs> I just did not sleep very much last night. I need everybody knowing that going in that there's just there's like 70 percent of Hank is in the studio today. Wow! I've turned off all the lights in my office except for one. (laughs) I'm just getting ready for why you're going to go to sleep after like in your office when this is over. I might go to sleep during the podcast. (laughs) No, (laughs) I'm so tired. Maybe we could all sleep and we were, could record an eight-hour podcast of us snoring, and it would be like a brand, breakthrough. We'd get in Vulture, they'd say, can you believe what they did? Wow, it's cutting-edge, avant-garde. Mm-hmm. You guys, what do you want them to do with your body when you're dead? Ooh, ooh, I want to be either, I think about this a lot, I want to be either put in one of those fields where people can like science, do science on you and see how the fungus grows oh, on your yeah. body. Mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. I want to just be fed to animals or I want to be put in a tree, but I feel like I heard the putting in the tree thing isn't good. You want to, do you want to get put in a tree? Oh, they like plant a tree in you or something. Is that real? Oh yeah. Let's so, like, yeah. put your body in the ground and put the tree on the body. Yeah. They don't like hang you. And you're like fertilizer. Like, yeah. Like just sort of strap you down. So you look like you're sleeping in the tree. <laughs> what if when the tree grew, <laughs> my skull was in the tree. That would be cool. Very cool. I hope yeah. I hope that that happens for you. I want to get incinerated mm. by like the biggest laser that has ever been made by humans. <laughs> Hank, I suspect you've you've <laughs> asked this question before because I feel like last time you wanted to be a, a mummified in the Arctic. You're right. Oh. I have, and I did, and that is actually what I actually want. And I feel like I wouldn't know that about you unless we talked about. Maybe we talked about it outside of a podcast contest. Maybe. Like, what do you I want bet you we've to done do it die? before. <laughs> it's I'm, on yeah, I'm Wikipedia. telling you, I'm very tired. I can't remember things right now. <laughs> I got like four and a half hours of sleep last night, mm. and I'm gonna get so many hours tonight. I'm gonna get all of them. I, nine Every o'clock to seven o'clock. That's what I'm doing tonight. You're not gonna stay up reading your phone until midnight, Hank. Yeah, I mean, I am. <laughs> you might Sarah, fall though. I, I fall asleep. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I might fall just out of the side of the bed. <laughs> That's where yeah. I'm at. Where I'm just gonna finish the sentences in my head instead of saying them out loud, which makes for yeah. great podcast content. Well, Sari, since we've talked about this before, why don't you tell me what you'd like them to do with my body? <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, interesting. I think you should live on forever as a skeleton within a, like a medical classroom or something like that. Ooh, so everyone can I say, oh, yeah, this is Hank Green, science communicator. Oh, is that an option? Can you get to can you get to decide to be a skeleton? It's my body. I feel like I should be able to d- make that decision. Like I want those dermestid beetles to eat my flesh off and then I want someone to articulate me. Yeah, because then you can still make will. TikToks even after your death. Someone <laughs> yeah, can make TikToks can with a, you. We can put a wig on you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they could just like ai my voice it could just be sari talking through a modulator and should just be like hey what's up it's hank yeah uncle hank's click clack tiktoks all right it's great it's great thank you sari i'm i'm in <laughs> sam and i think that they should take uh your body and send it to the moon uh, so that it can be there for future aliens when they come by to be like, oh, that's that must have been what they were like. Yeah, they could check out your cool. brain too, maybe cut it open, see. Oh, wow. Creepy. Ooh, she went to MIT, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> they'll be like, oh, she was sad, huh? <laughs> yeah, we could tell just by looking every week here on SciShow Tangents we get together to try to one-up amaze and delight each other with science facts while also trying to stay on topic and we're playing for glory here or I'm not they are uh, but also for Hank Bucks which I will be awarding as we play in at the end of the episode we'll have a winner and they'll get to brag now as always we're going to introduce this week's topic with the traditional science poem this week it's from Sam 
In popular culture, lasers are so cool. From ray guns to swords to sci-fi multi-tools, they're easy to mm. use, come in lots of fun colors. You can use them to fuse things or blast evil space smugglers. But lasers in real life, let it be understood, <laughs> seem to mostly be used to cut things out of balsa wood. They aren't for blowing up aliens or being fired at spaceships. They're taking babies' temperatures and etching things into microchips. Mm -hmm. Or they're used in a lab by some nerd at MIT to accelerate really? molecules <laughs> as part of their graduate degree. And you probably have to be real smart to make them work and know stuff about physics, optics, wires, and quarks. Quarks. Is that and quarks. 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 Well, that simply can't stand. Laser should be real fun. So I'm putting my foot down and speaking for everyone. Scientists, please do us dumb guys a favor. You can make anything else boring, but just let us have lasers. <laughs> <laughs> the most common use of a laser has to be cat toy. It has to be, has to be <laughs> number one. Yeah, a sad. pointer. It's it is a little bit sad. Like a ball with a, there's like it's and it's also the same device that's like the cat toy and also for your PowerPoint Ooh. presentation where you're like, Ooh. now point number two here is the, the difficulty. And you can aim that of, thing at the wall all day long. It's not gonna burn a hole in anything. It's not. Though it is like, don't look at it. Yeah, except, except it'll burn a hole in your eyeball. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was so scared of lasers when I was growing up because because of that. They were like, there are, we got we got the powerful boys now. We get, we got yeah, some lasers you have true. to worry about. Yeah, you don't want to stick your hand under a, a laser cutter laser. You'll, mm. It'll burn you like it'll burn the balsa wood. That's right. <laughs> Will it? I don't know. It might be a different thing. It might like hit that water and be like, I can't handle this. I'm tougher I don't than actually laser. know. I wouldn't put my hand under the balsa wood laser when it's making that really cool uh, coaster that you're going to put <laughs> on your Etsy store. So lasers are fantastic. And I think that we know what they are. Am I right, Sari? That at least we can draw so. a pretty sharp line around what a laser is. Yeah, it gets a little blurry, but we're, we oh, sharpen no. it right back up. Because I got to okay. start with the etymology. To show you where the blur mm. is. Oh, I see. Because it's actually laser is a thing. It stands right. for something. Laser is an acronym. And it wasn't the original acronym. In Ooh. 1955, oh. the first device that used stimulated emission of radiation was microwave amplification by stimulated oh. emission of radiation, also known as a maser. And so we oh. had masers. So we had masers first. Yeah, we had Mazers first. Mazer was the original. Mm, and then that. afterward, people were like, hmm, what if we amplified uh, st and stimulated emission of radiation using other wavelengths that are not mm -hmm. microwave, specifically stuff in the optical spectrum? Like stuff you can see, visible light. Visible light. Yeah. And so, so somewhere around 1957 to 1959, or maybe 1960. It's there's a hot debate about who first came up with the the word laser. Um, okay. Some people were calling them optical masers, which didn't catch okay. on. Boring, but, bad. But then, yeah. oh, oh, masers. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you have oh masers, or some guy named Gould was like, "What if we just call it a laser? <laughs> Light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation." Uh, like a maser, but cooler. So we'll call it a laser. And there was a debate, I think, and one had one term had to win, and so mm -hmm. laser won out. Okay, you don't have to answer. I just want to say a couple of words out loud because there's yes. lots of other wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. can I have a laser, X-ray <laughs> amplification by stimulated emission oh. or whatever? Uh, mm -hmm. Can I have? Uh, ultraviolet one that's called a laser. Can I have a gamma <laughs> radiation one that's called a gazer? <laughs> <laughs> I think you can call them whatever you want, but nowadays, I will. <laughs> in general parlance, mm -hmm. uh, everyone just uses laser for any frequency. Okay. Masers or lasers? Some people use masers to say microwave or lower, and anything Oh. Higher frequency than microwave is a laser. Anything below microwave is a maser. But yeah. some people just generalize and say they're all lasers. It's a, it's a better word. What what in what in like simple terms is a laser? This is hard for me to explain because I'm not a physicist. Yes. But we mentioned mm. in a previous episode, I think the mirrors episode, there is a um, a device called an etalon. 
in optics or a Fabry Perot inferometer, which is two mirrors on the ends of a cavity that are parallel to each other. And they're along a tube. So like you imagine a cylinder, there are two mirrors on the end. And waves can pass through the optical cavity, one of those mirrors, only when they're a certain certain frequency. So with a, a laser or something, it takes advantage of the fact that um, some atoms absorb energy and then release photons, and, and that generates light. Mm-hmm. And as you input energy into the system, it releases photons, and those photons start bouncing back and forth in, in the mirror, which mm. activates more atoms, which emit more photons, and eventually you have this cascading effect of more and more and more photons being emitted Mm. and bouncing back and forth in this little tube. And then they reach the frequency or they are at the frequency that escapes the mirror. And so you have a bunch of photons of light, very, very aligned because they've just been bouncing back and forth in this little chamber that shoot off into the, Uh into space. And that is my best. It was a little rough. So like it bounces uh, back and it gets a little bit more photons and they bounce back and they get more photons and they're all uh, sort of aligned uh, because of that, because the mm-hmm. mirror thing. And then how do you let them out eventually? Is there like a little hole or Open is it like a partially silvered Pew. mirror where some can leak? I think one of the mirrors can partially leak. Oh, gotcha. yeah. I really thought your explanation was going to make them sound more boring, but it made them sound even cooler, actually. Oh. Yeah, I, I just remember. <laughs> so this is where <laughs> my memory is failing. I remember the animation on the top of the laser dome was like photons in like a dancing motion and being like one <laughs> uh-huh. goes that this way and then okay. two go back this way and, that's what I and mean. so that's <laughs> ingrained in my head uh, <laughs> but then the, i can't remember the animation for the whole like raising the oh. electron level and then spitting out the photons so that part of the explanation is a little rockier i love that lasers are cool and they got a cool name yeah. I'm just like very happy nice. for lasers. Mm-hmm. Also, Sam, in your poem, I have to call you out on something. You said oh, that God. the the, sm- the smugglers yeah. were bad guys, but they never are. Well, that's true. They're the ant- they're always good guys. That's the closest <laughs> thing I could arm with colors. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You could have been like awesome, great smugglers. Just great, awesome smugglers like Han Solo. The yeah, smugglers are, right. I don't know why the smugglers are always good guys. Because they're anti authoritarian. They're anti authority. Yeah. yeah, and authority yeah. in space series is usually yeah, even more no dystopian good. than the authority yeah, yeah. in real life. Yeah. yeah, I think next time I go overseas, I'm going to smuggle something. But I think you should really respect trade barriers, and you shouldn't do smuggling. That's my hardline stance. No smuggling allowed. Mm-hmm. So thank <laughs> goodness for a great word with an easy etymology and a definition that definitely is clear. It never happens, but here we no. are today. And that means that it's time for the quiz portion of our show, Because lasers have been a figment of our creative imaginations for some time, but their uses aren't limited to science fiction. Scientists have been finding very real ways to use lasers to make things that sound made up, but are not. So today I'm going to be telling you a tale of three things made with lasers, and two of them are just plain lies. So tell me which one the true one is. It could be this first one. Using a focused laser beam and mirrors, scientists were able to fabricate gold nanoparticle plated armor that protected bacterial cells from being engulfed by immune cells. It might be that one, but it might be story number two, where scientists devised a way to make lasers that can work on a thin, flexible substance, which they then turned into a contact lens that can shoot green lasers. <laughs> <laughs> That could be it, but it could also be the third one here. Scientists used an optical laser to create extreme heat and pressure so that they could accomplish what alchemists had long tried to achieve. Just on a nanoparticle scale, they were able to convert lead into gold. So it could either be scientists crafting gold-plated armor for bacteria using lasers, scientists making contact lenses that can shoot lasers, or scientists wielding lasers to turn lead into gold nanoparticles. I would think bacteria is that having gold on a bacteria would be like, oh, I'm safe, but at what cost? Because they got to be like squishy and flowing around, right? Maybe. Also, why would you want to protect bacteria? Yeah, I don't know. I feel like the bacteria that's in our I gut. Mean, sometimes there's some, there. most of them are good guys. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, but they don't need our help. They're fine. They yeah, can they're replicate good. pretty quick. They're, yeah. They can just split off another one of themselves and be like, run while you still can. Right? <laughs> they are good I'm at eat, that. Eat <laughs> um, what's the second? The contact lenses. So first of all, it couldn't be very strong. You burn your eyelids off. Second of all, <laughs> <laughs> it probably would just be like, if it's just like a faint glow, totally. I'm sure someone's working on that. So maybe, mm-hmm. I mean, maybe that one. I feel like you'd have to pack whatever is in a laser. So like some something that gets the light, like that gets mm-hmm. the light energy. Something that mm-hmm. like a crystal or a glass or an optical material that will have its electrons excited and then spew out the photons. And I feel like that would be hard oh. to pack into a contact lens. Okay. And I don't know enough about anything to know the last one. That seems plausible, I suppose. If you shoot something with enough little beams, it'll change into something else. Where are lead and gold on the periodic table? I have no idea. Am I allowed to look that up or no? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. I think that they're quite close, but I don't. I think that that was the, that's the kind of idea. Oh, yeah. 82. So 82 is yeah. lead. 79 is gold. Turn lead into gold. Yeah, I think that's possible. So I'm just imagining you got a laser beam. Imagine like your sci-fi narrative, but on a very, yeah. very tiny just scale tiny. where you got you a laser. Go, pew. And you go pew, pew. I'm going to yeah, knock yeah. some neutrons out of you. <laughs> pew, pew. Yeah, and then get rich. <laughs> and get small to gold. So I think it's the third one. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the first one, actually. All right. Here's the situation. Uh, we did use super strong lasers to turn polyethylene plastic into nano diamonds, which is maybe even, uh, you know, in terms of like value creation, better than turning lead into yeah. gold. Uh, mm-hmm. But maybe not because nano diamonds probably aren't that that valuable. But we did not, we weren't able to knock a bunch of atoms off of lead to make oh, gold. Dang. That'd be pretty, that'd be, pr- or uh, protons, I should say, not atoms. That'd be, that'd be tricky. And a nuclear reaction that I would be, uh, not want to be nearby, <laughs> but you know, uh, like the weird, like lasers are definitely involved in nuclear reactions. So I'm not saying it's impossible. And Sam, uh, there, uh, we did use lasers to manipulate the position of golden nanoparticles inside of cells. And they're used by scientists to study particular parts of cells and, and help them figure out how they work. And, and they wanted to see if they could manipulate and localize those gold nanoparticles with a laser. So they infused cells with gold ion solutions to get through that membrane, and then they use the laser to manipulate the uh. nanoparticles into the area of the cell they wanted them to be in. They were able to use the, the lasers to push around the gold nanoparticles inside of the cells, which is very cool, but it is not creating gold-plated armor for bacteria ah, using lasers. So in fact, in 2018, what? scientists uh, created cool. super thin membrane lasers that can be charged with blue light. So you like charge them up with light, And they usually need some kind of solid support to make them stable. But the researchers worked on a way to make a thin sheet with lasers in uh, in it that was mounted on a glass substrate and then taking away that substrate so that you could just have the thin membrane. And the laser they constructed was about one one thousandth of a millimeter thick. And then they put their lasers in a contact lens and put them on uh, cow eyeballs. That had been previously moved from the cow. So that oh, wasn't okay. like a cow currently. A cow laser uh, okay. And they used the blue light to charge up the laser and they saw a laser beam coming off a of cow eyeballs. Why'd they do it? I can't really say. <laughs> I think that they had some ideas that it might be useful for some reasons, but like none of them sounded particularly plausible to me. It uh-huh. more seemed like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could create cow cyclops from the X-Men? A cow. <laughs> but, but a cow. Yeah. So wow. I'm sorry. Neither of you get anything. That's wild. Um, no, I, that's very I, cool. Yeah. It sounded so fake. Yeah. But it does sound scientists fake. Scientists will go out and do anything out here. <laughs> there you go, Sam. Like here's here are these scientists trying to make lasers a little bit cooler. Be like, what if we <laughs> have cows that shoot laser beams from their eye? The picture of the cow eyeball isn't very cool though. It's just really gross. <laughs> no, cow eyeballs on their own aren't great. <laughs> they also stuck one of the membranes onto one of the researchers' thumbnails so you could have like a fancy laser laser, thumbnail. laser finger. <laughs> really cool. <laughs> Really That's great cool. job, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. We're going to take a short break, and then it will be time for the Fact Off. Welcome back, everybody. Get ready 
for the fact guys. Our panelists have brought science facts to present to me in an attempt to blow my mind. And after they have presented their facts, I will judge them and award Hank Bucks any way I see fit. But to decide who goes first, I have a trivia question for you. In the first half of the 20th century, a man named Joe Woodland was at the beach when he drew up the idea for the barcode in the sand. He was like, this is a great idea. Look at these bars I've drawn in the sand. He'd been thinking about (laughs) coming up with a code that could be printed on groceries so that stock taking and checkout would be faster. And sitting at that beach, he devised a system inspired by Morse code that used wide and narrow lines to identify products. That system would later become the basis for the universal product code, which uses lines and lasers to help scan items at stores. What was the first year that an item marked with the UPC code was used at checkout? Oh, First half, 1951 is my guess. Wait, what was in the first? Did you say in the first half or just any time? No, I just said when was it? 1971. The answer, Sam Schultz, is 1974. Wow, I have a bunch of items that doesn't have a bar UPC codes on it. So that's how I know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it was a, it was a wrigley's juicy fruit chewing gum oh um, wow cho- yeah <laughs> so it was chosen specifically to prove that the code could be printed on even a very small product okay. so it wasn't like they had to just buy like a special machine that was like here's the machine we used to scan the gum is that what it was like for a while <laughs> <laughs> you've bought one gum it's only Oop. for the gum <laughs> yeah <laughs> then everything else is gonna tally up by yeah. hand punch it in um but sarah the, the tech the patent for the technology was actually filed in 1949 so if we're going wow. by the patent you would be closer but that it needed a lot of time before it was uh actually able to work because the tech had to catch up with it. Uh, mm-hmm. And they weren't super popular originally, but as larger stores adopted them, they became much more popular. And then the stores kept getting bigger and and we needed we needed that support. We needed more stuff. From the great people at the Universal Product Code place. I don't know. <laughs> I assume that there's some kind of group that oh handles guy. this. Who's drawing all the new ones? Like big bar, little bar, <laughs> big bar, big bar. Ah, oh, shit, I've already done big bar, big bar. <laughs> <laughs> oh god so sam that that means you get to decide who goes first i'm gonna go first i could never live with myself if i said sarah should go first and hers is really good i would just hang up the call yeah. having a device in your home <laughs> that can instantly produce a fully cooked dinner is a sci-fi staple a la the replicators on star trek or i don't know like the jetsons or something and while we are at the point where we're starting to successfully 3d print certain foods the fully cooked element has so far eluded us like you can 3d print chicken breasts all day long but they're still coming out raw you're gonna need to cook that bad boy and, and having to cook something <laughs> isn't very futuristic and it seems that 3d printed food especially meat is also trickier to cook uh, than than regular food in the first place too but in 2022 a research team from columbia university made a massive breakthrough in the field of instant dinners laser cooking what they came up with was the first attempt at a device that will both print and cook your dinner replicator style well okay so right off the bat this thing isn't like a replicator because instead of raw atoms getting sequenced into any food you want the team uh, starts this process by blending up a bunch of raw chicken breasts and and loading it into a 3d printer then they print a big old raw chicken nugget Uh, like i said (laughs) cooking 3d printed meat is tricky or at least different i think from cooking your traditional straight off the animal meat or as the team says in their video about this process current cooking techniques don't provide the high spatial resolution required to cook 3d printed food which is just a really weird thing to say that is weird Uh, to me i'm (laughs) like really 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 do we need high spatial is that because this is going to be a problem for me (laughs) <laughs> if it's if it, I need to buy a new device to to eat a well, certain kind of food, buckle up, buddy. So to solve this problem, okay. the team shoots their three D printed chicken with no less than three different lasers to cook it: a blue laser, a near infrared laser, and a mid infrared laser. So the blue laser penetrates the food to cook the inside of it using a pattern device for optimal chicken cooking. Then the infrared lasers can be used to brown the outside or to put grill lines on the chicken. Because why not? <laughs> And the result, 
<laughs> and the result, according to the team, laser cooked chicken are more moist, apparently, and also shrink less than old fashioned chicken breasts. The team had people taste test their 3D printed laser cooked chicken and traditionally cooked non 3D printed chicken. And apparently, according to them, people preferred the laser chicken because of that moisture. So the video that the team put out that I referenced earlier hedged a little bit more by simply stating that the 3D laser chicken was edible and achieved food safe temperatures. Apparently, (laughs) some taste. (laughs) It was no McDonald's chicken nugget. (laughs) Yeah. That's what they're saying. What is? Apparently, some taste testers said they could taste the unmistakable metallic tang of laser, which I imagine sort of tastes like how laser printers smell, you know? Uh, And they compared it, the smell, to having fillings put in their teeth. But, you know, I guess that's the one they liked better for some reason. Uh, So the team imagines that eventually we'll have like a microwave like device in our homes filled with meat goo that we can push like the chicken breast button. In a couple minutes, we'll pull out a moist, scientifically perfectly cooked 3D printed chicken breast. Or at that point, I can do anything I want with it. I can make a chicken nugget in the shape (laughs) of the Eiffel Tower. Why would I eat a a chicken breast if I could if I could eat a chicken, you know, like a chicken ball or a chicken dinosaur? (laughs) Well, you're really you're really naming things that already exist <laughs> with true. your there are vast imagination <laughs> right now, yeah. Hank. <laughs> I forgot dinosaur chicken Round nuggets chicken are a thing. Dinosaur <laughs> chicken, totally a thing. <laughs> Dang no, it, I want a ball know. shape. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's going to be the shape of a nose. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> Good. Chicken again. <laughs> it's got to be a tree. Got to be a pig. Some other animals that are cute. A manatee. Uh, what if it was uh, yeah, whatever. I'm not. I'm not going to go on this flight of fancy with you. <laughs> yeah, we wouldn't want to have any fun. <laughs> I couldn't think of anything really. <laughs> <laughs> so one state of benefit was maximum food customization based on your taste, uh, and the Scientific uh-huh. American article I was reading suggested a burger with alternating medium and well done sections in a checkerboard Ooh, pattern. Because again, that. why not? And a, uh-huh. another benefit, which is actually more cool, is that they can cook the food through plastic packaging. So they think that they could reduce the risk of contamination for stuff like pre cooked meals mm-hmm. you can get at grocery stores. Mm-hmm. So in conclusion, the future is here, and it's an unseasoned 3D printed chicken breast cooked by lasers. Neat. I love it. If it can <laughs> write grill lines on there, I could also put like a note to my son. Be like, <laughs> I love you, that buddy. I so hope you're cute. enjoying octonauts and he's eating his chicken breast. You could print your own in face on it. Being like, hey, what's, that? <laughs> <laughs> what's that? Oh, it's my dad. It's, oh, yeah. you got one of those microwazers, huh? <laughs> 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 yeah, it's it's an amazers. It should have been microwazers. Yeah, that's <laughs> really good. So good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sari. <laughs> Can you beat microwazers making 3D printing Eiffel Towers made out of chicken slop? <laughs> <laughs> Ground chicken. Yeah, that's it. Um I'll try my best. So, lightning can be really dangerous because many things don't do so well with a sudden blast of high voltage and high amperage current, especially living things whose bodies depend on electrical balance or flammable things that can't handle high temperatures without combusting. So, in general, this is a little preamble because I decided to make my life hard this episode. Lightning happens because negative charge gathers at the bottom of a cloud of water vapor or dust or something, and the ground's neutral charges are relatively positive. Air isn't super conductive in its everyday form, but when enough charge builds up and kind of spurts out of the cloud or the ground, it ionizes some air molecules, which makes it more conductive. And eventually, all the system hits a breaking point and carves out an easier path for electrons to flow. And when those electrons move all at once, that's a lightning strike. And lightning tends to strike tall things like towers because that height sort of provides a shorter path for the electrons to travel from the cloud to something. And lightning rods are conductive structures that people intentionally use in this way for some amount of safety and control. So trying to get lightning to connect at a specific tall point and run through a wire to the ground without damaging unsuspecting people or things. But lightning rods, as I found out, aren't a surefire protection or even particularly great. They only cover about a couple dozen meters in every direction, Mm. uh, depending on what they're made of. So if lightning is brewing a little too far away from a lightning rod, the strike could easily hit a different part of a building or bystander. And you need multiple lightning rods to create a bigger area of protection. And so far, as far as I can tell, we just kind of lived with that risk. 
But in the summer of 2021, on Santis Mountain in Switzerland, a research team used lasers to help redirect lightning bolts toward a telecommunications tower that's there to help measure this kind of electrical storm stuff. The basic idea is that high-powered lasers can ionize some air molecules and basically help carve out that path that guides the flow of electrons from the cloud to the lightning rod and vice versa. So to test that, they shot intense, short laser pulses based on yttrium aluminum garnet crystals up towards a thunderstorm and observed what happened with high-speed cameras. And it turned out that in four times, when the laser pulses coincided with lightning strikes, the lightning followed the path of the laser for around 50 to 60 meters, basically increasing the protection radius of the lightning rod by that much. And besides the fact that this worked, they redirected lightning with lasers, which is Mm -hmm. a very cool sentence. It's Mm -hmm. extra cool because using lasers can theoretically work to clear paths for lightning, even in foggy or other tricky weather conditions, because the photon beams can just blast right through the water droplets and vaporize them. So they want to keep experimenting to use lasers to extend lightning rods even further and hopefully develop more protective uh, sci-fi future systems against nature's unpredictable electricity. So does the laser, like, does, is the laser have to be in the place where the where the lightning is coming down or can the laser be like somewhere else? If I'm like way over here and there's like a big tall building, can I shoot a laser and help the lightning come down at the, or is it going to like follow me? I think it's going to follow the path of the laser. So the laser has to be where the where the lightning rods are? Yeah, and be like, okay. and it extends it vertically kind of. This is good news because it means that we can't intentionally make a laser make a, a lightning hit someone. You could plant a laser on them though, right? Sneak one into there. Yeah, you could plant you could plant a, a yttrium laser on them. On top of their head somehow. <laughs> Give them a hat. Here's here's your new hat. If they're hanging out Ooh, on a great. park bunch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> laser this shooting on the top of the hat. <laughs> a very powerful laser shooting up. It Some mystery novelist is taking notes right now. <laughs> yeah. They're like, this is how Rush is going to start killing spies. <laughs> uh-huh. yeah. Ultimately, I'm like, I'm 99% sure that in the future, we're going to be using lasers to like increase the, the working distance of a lightning rod. Seems like, why not do mm-hmm. that? Like, it's, it's working. It's good. But the like 20% sure that we're going to have microwasers. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a much bigger impact on my personal life. Yeah, mm-hmm. to have to That's to have true. like a device in my home that just yeah. sort of like creates food in any shape or <laughs> level of doneness I require. And as a bonus, it shrinks less. I love that. That was one of those things. <laughs> yeah, shrinks it's juicy. Less. It's juicier. <laughs> it's and real it shrinks juicy. Less. It's like yeah, because yeah, the water's still in there. You print out a perfect replica of your own body, and you can eat it for dinner. Come on. You could print out your arm and just be like, ow, ow, ow. I like the idea of printing out like a full sized <laughs> Hank out of chicken meat and then having a bunch of people over. I was <laughs> like, dip me in the sauces. That would be great. Yeah. Take your finger off. Don't. That would be really fun, actually. <laughs> yeah. They'd be like, well, how big is your microwaser, Hank? <laughs> like, I did it section by section. Took a long time. <laughs> Some of Meat Hank is quite old. <laughs> it's been around some days. <laughs> I'm gonna give it to Sam. Yeah, yeah. baby. <laughs> yeah, I'm so, I didn't think I would, but then I kept I kept coming back around to it. It's just it's a. I mean, they're both so good. Mm-hmm. Laser guided lightning Lasers are cool, but there's just so yeah. it's fertile ground there. With, uh, <laughs> 3D printing meat and using three different kinds of lasers to cook it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That means that it's time to ask the science couch where we've got a listener question for our couch of finely honed scientific minds. At Sloth Queen asks, what's the longest a laser can shoot? Well, if you shot one into space, would it, it would just go forever? Yeah. Or not? That's my kind of feeling is if it's, if you don't hit, you know, there's like gas and dust in the universe eventually. Oh, yeah. But I, I, I feel like infinity. It's still the laser. I feel like as yeah. long as the time that you have to wait. <laughs> is, that, is that right, Sari? I think so. But I'll, I'll lead up to it with my discoveries of longest laser that just kept escalating as I tried Googling different things. Because you can't just Google lo- how long no. can a laser shoot. No. You got to like guess what long distances are. So first oh. thing I thought, 
what if you pointed at a friend kind of far away? And the thing that I found in this circumstance is that the FAA is very vigilant about laser incidents Mm -hmm. of people on the surface of the earth pointing lasers up towards planes. And cruising altitude is generally between 10 and 12,000 meters. So a laser shined from the surface of the earth can be quite distracting or blinding to a pilot if it gets up into the airplane. And that, of course, depends on weather conditions. So it can definitely go as far as ground to plane. And then I was like, well, okay, space. On the moon, left by Apollo astronauts, there are reflecting mirrors on there that have been used continuously since 1969 to study like the Earth moon system and how far the moon is away from the Earth. There are five uh, retro reflector arrays, is what they're called. And I think any lab or any person can just shine lasers at the moon and measure the distance from the moon to their spot at Earth and be like, wow. huh, that's neat. Uh, <laughs> and so you just shine your laser to where these known mirrors are and it'll, and, and you can like wow. see the laser beam from Earth, detect it from Earth. And then I was like, okay, how far in space can we go? And this is the farthest that I found where a powerful, Radio wave laser called a mega maser. So they <laughs> specifically called it a, uh-huh. both a laser and a maser in the same sentence. Uh, has been observed by a telescope in South Africa. This mega maser is about five billion light years from Earth. And so the light from this mega maser has traveled 58,000 billion billion kilometers from its origin point to Earth. Which is basically infinity. Yeah, like, it it's so go, far. It can go five billion light years. It can go uh, forever. Yeah. If, if there was aliens, would we be able to see their lasers? Not, not unless they. So are we? We're can't point it at us. Yeah. So there's a couple. There's a couple of prob like re- reasons they would have had to have pointed them at us at the right moment in their history. It would have to be bright enough for our detectors to detect. Which I don't. Those would be tricky. I don't think that we could do that with any of our current lasers. I think there are experiments in laser communication. I don't think we've sent it very far. I think we've mostly used it, like, obviously we're on Earth, so that's the easiest place to test communication (laughs) is on Earth to satellites or things like that. But there's a whole Wikipedia article about laser communication in space that I kind of glossed over and then was like, I'm going to stick with the Mega Maser. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to ask the Science Couch your question, follow us on Twitter at SciShowTangents. We'll tweet up to- topics for upcoming episodes every week uh, there, or you can join the SciShowTangents Patreon uh, and ask us on our Discord. Thank you to at Firigion, Les on Discord, and everybody else who asked us your question for this episode. If you like this show and you want to help us out, hey, it's very easy to do that. You can go to patreon.com slash scishowtangents. Become a patron of our show and get access to things like our newsletter and our bonus episodes. And a special thanks to patrons John Pollock and Les Aker. Second, you can leave us a review wherever you listen. That's super helpful and it helps us know what you like about the show. And finally, if you want to show your love for SciShow Tangents, just tell me tell about, people about us. us. Thank you for joining us. I've been Hank Green. I've been Sari Riley. And I've been Sam Schultz. SciShow Tangents is created by all of us and produced by Sam Schultz. Our associate producer is Faith Schmidt. Our editor is Seth Glicksman. Our story editor is Alex Billow. Our social media organizer is Julia Buzz Bazayo. Our editorial assistant is Deboki Chakravarti. Our sound design is by Joseph Tuna Medish. Our executive producers are Caitlin Hoffmeister and me, Hank Green. And of course, we couldn't make any of this without our patrons on Patreon. Thank you. And remember, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be lighted. But one more thing. We've mentioned dead butt syndrome on a previous episode of the pod, but the more technical term for this achy pain is gluteus medius tendinopathy. And that's a fancy way of saying that the tendons that connect your butt muscles to your bones and help you walk are inflamed. There are various ways to rest or stretch to help your butt tendons recover, but one possible treatment is low-level laser therapy. 
LLLT involves shining short wavelength, single color light to help promote all kinds of biological repair processes, including helping cells proliferate, reducing inflammation and upregulating growth factors. How do they get to the lasers into the butt? I don't know. <laughs> pew, pew pew. It's only for butt. There's for every. It's for other parts of your body. I think you can use tendon. it for a bunch yeah. of things. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah. You just yeah. got a little creative with it. Yeah, yeah, I think that they shoot it through the skin. <laughs> yes, this is the more practical one. My other butt fact option was woman farts during surgery and then catches on fire, which was very <gasps> dubious of an article. <laughs> From a because laser? Yeah, they were using, well, yeah, using laser on her butthole and then she farted oh. and then they were like, it caught on fire. But it's dubious because your farts have to have a lot of flammable gas and they don't always <laughs> yeah. have that composition they don't usually have that much flammable gas i mean mm-hmm. there's a little bit but like what's gonna catch on fire all that stuff's in the uh, they yes. get uh, it's it's definitely dubious to me there's not a lot of flammable material left yeah. during an operation they, they tend to do their best to remove that <laughs> and not have this it is, around this is not a canon butt fact everybody uh, no. it's a non-canon butt mind. fact <laughs> yeah don't <laughs> 